If you enjoy what you're hearing, don't forget to hit like and subscribe so we can find each other again in future. And if you want to support the channel further, please consider supporting me over on Patreon. Hello there, my name is John, and I'm here to bring you a sleep story. So find some place comfortable, lie back, let your arms and legs fall slack at your sides, take a deep breath, and close your eyes. Tonight, we rejoin a wizard named Howl, a young apprentice named Michael, and an old woman named Sophie Hatter, as we continue with Howl's Moving Castle by Diana Wynne Jones. Chapter 12 In which Sophie becomes Howl's old mother. Sophie did not see much point in blackening Howell's name to the king, now that the witch had caught up with him. But Howell said it was more important than ever. I shall need everything I've got just to escape the witch, he said. I can't have the king after me as well. So the following afternoon, Sophie put on her new clothes and sat feeling very fine, if rather stiff, waiting for Michael to get ready and for Howell to finish in the bathroom. While she waited, she told Calcifer about the strange country where Howell's family lived. It took her mind off the king. Calcifer was very interested. I knew he came from foreign parts, he said, but this sounds like another world. Clever of the witch to send the curse in from there. Very clever all around. That's magic I admire using something that exists anyway, and turning it round into a curse. I did wonder about it when you and Michael were reading it the other day. That fool Howl told her too much about himself. Sophie gazed at Calcifer's thin blue face. It did not surprise her to find Calcifer admired the curse, any more than it surprised her when he had called Howl a fool. He was always insulting Howl. But she never could work out if Calcifer really hated Howl. Calcifer looked so evil anyway that it was hard to tell. Calcifer moved his orange eyes to look into Sophie's. I'm scared too, he said. I shall suffer with Howl if the witch catches him. If you don't break the contract before she does, I won't be able to help you at all. Before Sophie could ask more, Howl came dashing out of the bathroom, looking his very finest, scenting the room with roses and yelling for Michael. Michael clattered downstairs in his new blue velvet. Sophie stood up and collected her trusty stick. It was time to go. You look wonderfully rich and stately, Michael said to her. She does me credit, said Howl, apart from that awful old stick. Some people said Sophie, are thoroughly self-centered. This stick goes with me. I need it for moral support. Howell looked at the ceiling, but he did not argue. They took their stately way into the streets of Kingsbury. Sophie, of course, looked back to see what the castle was like here. She saw a big, arched gateway surrounding a small black door. The rest of the castle seemed to be a blank stretch of plastered wall between two carved stone houses. Before you ask, said Howell, it's really just a disused stable. This way. They walked through the streets, looking at least as fine as any of the passers-by. Not that many people were about. Kingsbury was a long way south, and it was a bakingly hot day there. The pavements shimmered. Sophie discovered another disadvantage to being old. You felt queer in hot weather. The elaborate buildings wavered in front of her eyes. She was annoyed, because she wanted to look at the place, but all she had was a dim impression of golden domes and tall houses. By the way, Howell said, Mrs. Pensemon will call you Mrs. Pendragon. Pendragon's the name I go under here. Whatever for? said Sophie. For disguise said Howell. Pendragon's a lovely name, much better than Jenkins. 
I get by quite well with a plain name, Sophie said as they turned into a blessedly narrow, cool street. We can't all be mad hatters, said Howell. Mrs. Pensemon's house was gracious and tall, near the end of the narrow street. It had orange trees in tubs on either side of its handsome front door. This door was opened by an elderly footman in black velvet, who led them into a wonderfully cool black and white checkered marble hall, where Michael tried secretly to wipe sweat off his face. Howell, who always seemed to be cool, treated the footman as an old friend and made jokes to him. The footman passed them on to a page boy in red velvet. Sophie, as the boy led them ceremoniously up polished stairs, began to see why this made good practice for meeting the king. She felt as if she were in a palace already. When the boy ushered them into a shaded drawing room, she was sure even a palace could not be this elegant. Everything in the room was blue and gold and white and small and fine. Mrs. Pensemon was finest of all. She was tall and thin, and she sat bolt upright in a blue and gold embroidered chair, supporting herself rigidly with one hand, in a gold mesh mitten, on a gold-topped cane. She wore old gold silk, in a very stiff and old-fashioned style, finished off with an old gold headdress, not unlike a crown, which tied into a large old gold bow beneath her gaunt eagle face. She was the finest and most frightening lady Sophie had ever seen. Ah, oh, my dear Howell, she said, holding out a gold mesh mitten. Howell bent and kissed the mitten, as he was obviously supposed to do. He did it very gracefully, but it was rather spoiled from the back view by Howell flipping his other hand furiously at Michael behind his back. Michael, a little too slowly, realized he was supposed to stand by the door beside the page boy. He backed there in a hurry, only too pleased to get as far away from Mrs. Pensemon as he could. Mrs. Pensemon, allow me to present my old mother, Howell said, waving his hand at Sophie. Since Sophie felt just like Michael, Howell had to flap his hand at her too. Charmed, delighted, said Mrs. Pensemon and she held her gold mitten out to Sophie. Sophie was not sure if Mrs. Pensemon meant her to kiss the mitten as well, but she could not bring herself to try. She laid her own hand on the mitten instead. The hand under it felt like an old, old claw. After feeling it, Sophie was quite surprised that Mrs. Pensemon was alive. Forgive my not standing up, Mrs. Pendragon, Mrs. Pensemon said. My health is not good. It forced me to retire from teaching three years ago. Pray sit down, both of you. Trying not to shake with nerves, Sophie sat grandly in the embroidered chair opposite Mrs. Pensemon's, supporting herself on her stick in what she hoped was the same elegant way. Howell spread himself gracefully in a chair next to it. He looked quite at home, and Sophie envied him. I am 86, Mrs. Pensemon announced. How old are you, my dear Mrs. Pendragon? Ninety, Sophie said, that being the first high number that came into her head. So old, Mrs. Pensemon said with what may have been slight, stately envy. How lucky you are to move so nimbly still. Oh, yes, she's so wonderfully nimble, Howell agreed that sometimes there's no stopping her. Mrs. Pensemon gave him a look, which told Sophie she had been a teacher, at least as fierce as Miss Angorian. I am talking to your mother, she said. I dare say she is as proud of you as I am. We are two old ladies who both had a hand in forming you. You are, one might say, our joint creation. Don't you think I did any of me myself then? Howell asked. Put in just a few touches of my own? A few, and those not altogether to my liking, Mrs. Pensemon replied. But you will not wish to sit here and hear yourself being discussed. You will go down and sit on the terrace, taking your page boy with you. 
where Hunch will bring you both a cool drink. Go along. If Sophie had not been so nervous herself, she might have laughed at the expression on Howell's face. He had obviously not expected this to happen at all, but he got up with only a slight shrug, made a slight warning face at Sophie, and shooed Michael out of the room ahead of him. Mrs. Pensemon turned her rigid body very slightly to watch them go. Then she nodded at the page boy, who scuttled out of the room. After that, Mrs. Pensemon turned herself back toward Sophie, and Sophie felt more nervous than ever. I prefer him with black hair, Mrs. Pensemon announced. That boy is going to the bad. Who, Michael? Sophie said, bewildered. Not the servitor, said Mrs. Pensemon. I do not think he is clever enough to cause me concern. I am talking about Howell, Mrs. Pendragon. Oh, said Sophie, wondering why Mrs. Pensemon only said going. Howell had surely arrived at the bad long ago. Take his whole appearance, Mrs. Pensemon said sweepingly. Look at his clothes. He is always very careful about his appearance, Sophie agreed, and wondered why she was putting it so mildly. And always was. I am careful about my appearance, too, and I see no harm in that, said Mrs. Pensemon. But what call has he to be walking around in a charmed suit? It is a dazzling attraction charm directed at ladies. Very well done, I admit, and barely detectable even to my trained eye, since it appears to have been darned into the seams, and one which will render him almost irresistible to ladies. This represents a downward trend into black arts, which must surely cause you some motherly concern, Mrs. Pendragon. Sophie thought uneasily about the gray and scarlet suit. She had darned the seams without noticing it had anything particular about it. But Mrs. Pensemon was an expert on magic, and Sophie was only an expert on clothes. Mrs. Pensemon put both gold mittens on top of her stick and canted her stiff body so that both her trained and piercing eyes stared into Sophie's. Sophie felt more and more nervous and uneasy. My life is nearly over, Mrs. Pensemon announced. I have felt death tiptoeing close for some time now. Oh, I'm sure that isn't so, Sophie said, trying to sound soothing. It was hard to sound like anything with Mrs. Pensemon staring at her like that. I assure you it is so, said Mrs. Pensemon. This is why I was anxious to see you, Mrs. Pendragon. Howell, you see was my last pupil, and by far my best. I was about to retire when he came to me out of a foreign land. I thought my work was done when I trained Benjamin Sullivan, whom you probably know better as Wizard Suleiman, rest his soul, and procured him the post of royal magician. Oddly enough, he came from the same country as Howell. Then Howell came, and I saw at a glance that he had twice the imagination and twice the abilities, and though I admit he had some faults of character, I knew he was a force for good. Good, Mrs. Pendragon. But what is he now? What indeed, Sophie said. Something has happened to him, Mrs. Pensamon said, still staring piercingly at Sophie. And I am determined to put that right before I die. What do you think has happened? Sophie asked uncomfortably. I must rely on you to tell me that, said Mrs. Pensemon. My feeling is that he has gone the same way as the Witch of the Waste. They tell me she was not wicked once, though I have this only on hearsay, since she is older than either of us and keeps herself young by her arts. Howell has gifts in the same order as hers. It seems as if those of high ability cannot resist some extra dangerous stroke of cleverness, which results in a fatal flaw and begins a slow decline to evil. Do you, by any chance, have a clue what it might be? Calcifer's voice came into Sophie's mind, saying, The contract isn't doing either of us any good in the long run. She felt a little chilly.
in spite of the heat of the day blowing through the open windows of the shaded, elegant room. Yes, she said. He's made some sort of contract with this fire demon. Mrs. Pensemon's hands shook a little on her stick. That will be it. You must break that contract, Mrs. Pendragon. I would if I knew how, Sophie said. Surely your maternal feelings and your own strong magic gift will tell you how, Mrs. Pensemon said. I have been looking at you, Mrs. Pendragon, though you may not have noticed. Oh, I noticed, Mrs. Pensemon, Sophie said. And I like your gift, said Mrs. Pensemon. It brings life to things such as that stick in your hand, which you have evidently talked to, to the extent that it has become what the layman would call a magic wand. I think you would not find it too hard to break that contract. Yes, but I need to know what the terms of it are, Sophie said. Did Howell tell you I was a witch? Because if he did, he did not. There is no need to be coy. You can rely on my experience to know these things, said Mrs. Pensemon. Then, to Sophie's relief, she shut her eyes. It was like a strong light being turned off. I do not know, nor do I wish to know, about such contracts, she said. Her cane wobbled again, as if she might be shuddering. Her mouth quirked into a line, suggesting she had unexpectedly bitten on a peppercorn. But now I see, she said, what has happened to the witch. She made a contract with a fire demon, and, over the years, that demon has taken control of her. Demons do not understand good and evil, but they can be bribed into a contract, provided the human offers them something valuable, something only humans have. This prolongs the life of both human and demon, and the human gets the demon's magic power to add to his or her own. Mrs. Pensemon opened her eyes again. That is all I can bear to say on the subject, she said, except to advise you to find out what that demon got. Now I must bid you farewell. I have to rest a while. And like magic, which it probably was, the door opened and the page boy came in to usher Sophie out of the room. Sophie was extremely glad to go. She was all but squirming with embarrassment by then. She looked back at Mrs. Pensemon's rigid, upright form as the door closed, and wondered if Mrs. Pensemon would have made her feel this bad if she had really and truly been Howell's old mother. Sophie rather thought she would. I take my hat off to Howell for standing her as a teacher for more than a day, she murmured to herself. Madam, asked the page boy, thinking Sophie was talking to him. I said, go slowly down the stairs, or I can't keep up, Sophie told him. Her knees were wobbling. You young boys dash about so, she said. The page boy took her slowly and considerately down the shiny stairs. Halfway down, Sophie recovered enough from Mrs. Pensemon's personality to think of some of the things Mrs. Pensemon had actually said. She had said Sophie was a witch. Oddly enough, Sophie accepted this without any trouble at all. That explained the popularity of certain hats, she thought. It explained Jane Ferrier's Count Whatsit. It possibly explained the jealousy of the Witch of the Waste. It was as if Sophie had always known this, but she had thought it was not proper to have a magic gift because she was the eldest of three. Letty had been far more sensible about such things. Then she thought of the gray and scarlet suit and nearly fell downstairs with dismay. She was the one who had put the charm on that. She could hear herself now murmuring to it. Built to pull in the girls she had told it, and of course it did. It had charmed Letty that day in the orchard. Yesterday, somewhat disguised, it must have had its secret effect on Miss Angorian too. Oh dear, Sophie thought. I've gone and doubled the number of hearts he'll have broken. 
I must get that suit off him somehow. Howell, in that same suit, was waiting in the cool black and white hall with Michael. Michael nudged Howell in a worried way as Sophie came slowly down the stairs, behind the page boy. Howell looked saddened. You seem a bit ragged, he said. I think we'd better skip seeing the king. I'll go and blacken my own name when I make your excuses. I can say my wicked ways have made you ill. That could be true from the look of you. Sophie certainly did not wish to see the king, but she thought of what Calcifer had said. If the king commanded Howell to go into the waste and the witch caught him, Sophie's own chance of being young again would have gone too. She shook her head. After Mrs. Pensemon, she said, the king of Ingery will seem just like an ordinary person. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this sleep story, feel free to leave a like and a comment. If you would like to support the channel further, you could subscribe to my Patreon. Link is in the description. If you would like to hear more sleep stories like this, don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell for all notifications. I upload a new story each and every week. Thank you again for listening, and pleasant dreams. Good night.